Hello guys, welcome back. Today um, we have here Ms. Rachel Besaganath from Hoerko Rustemurg. Um, the two students with me, Marli Kutsia, Dube, Remafilwe and Amlaira Brits. And yes, today we're going to enjoy this lease about the poem Still Our Eyes. Hello guys, let me quickly share my screen with you. Um, there we go. Okay, let's just start at the beginning. And slideshow. Okay, guys, out of all the poems, this is probably my favorite. Um, so if I explain it a little more enthusiastically than the others, um, that is why. Okay, I'm going to read the poem with you first of all. I have a clip where Maya Angelou, the poet herself, reads it, but I couldn't figure out how to put it in the slideshow um, because I'm a little bit technologically left behind. Okay, let's go. Still I rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Maybe you can hear the soulful cries here in the background, hey? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Okay, guys, can any of you at first glance Tell me what the poem is about. Ma'am, could it be about the poet who's trying to explain to us how there are certain people who want to um, break her down and see her in a negative side, but she still um, managed to go against up, up against the odds? Yes, exactly. Exactly, Dube. That's a perfect summary of the poem. Now, in order to understand the poem completely, we have to look at the background um, of the poet, Maya Angelou. She's the, a very famous American, African-American um, poet and author. And she was actually abused as a child as well, molested and abused. And I think this poem is a very personal account for her standing up against her oppressors, namely everyone who wants to keep her down, whether it's white people, men, or the people who abused her as a child. But it's also very universal. Hey, all of us have been oppressed at one time or another in our lives, whether it's because you are a girl or a woman or because you are black or because you are um, whatever the reason there are many reasons why we oppress people um and this poem then is a sort of like a an anthem for anyone who has been oppressed in their lives okay the poem roots itself in the history of the african american people with its talk of slavery and overcoming oppression people i want you to note specifically that maya angelou is american she's not south african so the poem is not about apartheid um 
indirectly it is because it's about all oppressed people but directly it's more about the slavery in america and then the civil rights movement that followed suit later okay um, but the poem does not only speak to one people, it speaks of the universal notion of downtrodden people. It's intended to be the voice of the unheard or voiceless. And there are two kinds of oppression that's addressed in the poem, namely racial oppression and sexism. Okay, she's a black woman, so therefore it's a double whammy of oppression. The theme or message, like Dewey just said, perseverance regardless of circumstances, a promise of triumph of African Americans over slavery and racism. The poem delivers the message of the human's um, incredible strength and ability to overcome hurt. However, the main and most important message of this poem provides is the hope for others who suffer the same ordeal as the narrator, that of discrimination on grounds of race and gender. This poem is not self-pity at all, as we will discuss later. It's more of strength and overcoming and hope. The type is a lyric. It's almost like a song, hey, like a story being told. Moon and Town, empowering pride, superiority, defiant, rebellious. We will discuss the Moon and Town in at length when we discuss the different stanzas. The structure, you can have a look at that later. Um, it's basically just there are many lines divided into nine stanzas and there's a rhyme scheme. Okay, the title, still. The poem could have just been entitled I Rise, but then it would have lost some of its impact because still can mean again and again, despite everything that happens, I still rise. Okay. And there's a reason why she put this word first, even though the sentence would normally read, I still rise. She emphasizes this word by placing it first, despite everything, you can try to keep me down, but I will still rise. The word I means it's a personal account. Hey, it's about her life specifically, but it's also universal. So it's both individual and universal. Rise literally and figuratively. To rise means to get up, okay? Or rise to the occasion, take the high road, gain power. Now let's have a look at stanza one. You may write me down in history. Um, Layla, what have women been treated like in history? Ma'am, women in history, they um, are they, they, uh, this, the men were superior against them and they needed to do whatever the men told them to do. So they didn't yeah. have their own choices and thoughts and doings and actions they wanted to do. They needed to do what they were told to be done. Yes, exactly. And when you consider the whole history of the world since time has started, it has been very recently that women have been given equal rights, the right to vote, the right to choose what you do with your body and so forth. Hey. Um, in some countries, certain transgressions against women are still legal. Women are still very much downtrodden, are not allowed to drive even in certain countries. Dube, can you tell me about the history of black people in a quick two sentence summary? Um, uh, in the past, they, they were um, taken, well, they were used as slaves, as property, and they were oppressed um, in general, um, in, uh, in terms of um, um, economically and socially, they were just um, kind of put out and um, closed outside of society. Yes, exactly. And have you ever spoken to your mother about her experiences as a black woman? I know that she's a very educated person, but have you spoken to her about the difficulty of getting to where she is today? Has it been an easy or a difficult road for her? It has been difficult for her to get to the place where she is, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I did. Yes. Okay, and does that, do you think, have anything to do with her race and gender? Um, yes, ma'am. 
Yes, definitely. Hey, and this is what the firm is about, specifically the difficulties that black women have had to be taken seriously, to be treated as equals. When we think about the history specifically of black women, um, it is not a very nice one. It has not been easy. Hey, if we think about someone like Sorki Bartman, do you know who that is? Okay, it's this um, Khoisan woman who was taken from South Africa and put in a French museum, a circus of freaks basically because of her um, big posterior, her big butt basically. And she was um, mocked and ridiculed for having certain features. And that is what Maya Angelou is talking about, how black women are portrayed in history, either as slaves or as temptresses um, of white men, for example. So you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. Who wrote down history? The historians, mostly white males. So their account of the experiences of a black woman is definitely not accurate. She's saying they um, are bitter and twisted, the lies that they tell about her. You, apostrophe, she's addressing these oppressors directly. Anyone who reads the poem, anyone who has ever oppressed someone will take it very personally because she starts with, you may write me down in history, involving the reader in the poem. Hey. Her oppressors presented a distorted view of black women throughout history by means of vicious lies in the past. The first lines speak of the history of slaves in America that has long been controlled by whites who decided what was recorded as history, what was true according to them and how they saw it. But it never spoke the truth of the lives, lives of the slaves. Obviously, people, because the slaves didn't write it themselves. Okay, bitter, twisted lies. People, do you see the um, assonance there, the repetition of the uh sound? And also there's a figure of speech called to, um, tautology, where you repeat the same thing in other words. Something that you do in your essays, hey, when you run out of words, you start repeating the same idea, but in different words. Now, bitter and twisted basically mean the same thing. It means that the people are threatened by her and jealous of her, and therefore they write these lies about her in the history books about black women. You may trod me in the very dirt. People, now trod is an odd word to use there. It should actually be tread, but she specifically, I think, used this word um, to indicate the word downtrodden, meaning someone who has been oppressed. To trod means literally to step on and figuratively to treat a person with enormous disrespect. If you step someone into the dirt, you can infer there that they have been treated very disrespectfully. Hey, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Marley, what happens when you step on dust? Um, because it's so light and the particles are small, they rise up into the air and it becomes exactly foggy, almost. Exactly, exactly. So she compares herself to dust, something that's worthless and annoying. Yet it has this wonderful quality that when you, the more you step on it, the more it rises. Oh, so in my opinion, this is a very effective figure of speech. Comparing yourself to something, uh, dirt and dust, things that are worthless, that are annoying, that are in the way, yet they have this wonderful quality of being able to rise. Okay, simile, you see the word like there. I highlighted all the figures of speech for you um, in yellow. Stanza two, does my sassiness upset you? Who knows what the word sassiness means? If you are sassy, you are a little bit cheeky. Hey, when you talk back. And calling a grown-up sassy is actually a little bit insulting. It's a word that we usually would use for children. Hey, why are you being so sassy with me? I won't tolerate your sass. 
So it's a little bit belittling um, calling someone sassy, but yet she says, does my sassiness upset you? I'm going to talk back if you go you're going to say something to me. And what type of questions does she use here? Does she expect an answer? No. Hey, so she uses rhetorical questions. Why, Leila, do you think she uses so many rhetorical questions in the poem? What is the function of rhetorical questions? Ma'am, I think she uses rhetorical questions to emphasize what she actually said and to um, let the reader think about what she said and how they treated her as person and that she doesn't she actually act the way they want her to, but how they um, see her in um, their eyes, but she isn't really like that. Exactly. People, she's involving the reader. When you ask someone a question, when I want to involve you in the lesson, what do I do? I ask you a question. Okay, so she's involving the reader, maybe even accusing the reader a little bit. Um, she's saying to them, listen, you, um, why does my sassiness upset you? Why are you so gloomy? Because I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Hey, was the listener overwhelmed with sadness or despair? Gloom means darkness. Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Now, this is a very powerful image. Hey, when someone has oil wells, they are very rich. Oil is something the world wants, and some nations would even go to war for, is this oil. And she doesn't walk like a downtrodden, poor person. She walks like a very rich oil magnate. She walks with confidence, in other words. Okay, I want you to remember this image because we're going to come back to it um, as we progress in the poem. Cause there, elision. When you leave something out, what was left out there? Is cause a complete word? No. What must it be? Mama, it should have been because. Because. And she left it out for the sake of um, making the poem more accessible. It's colloquial or authentic. It's the way she would normally speak. Stanza three. Just like moons and like suns with a certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Now this is a wonderful metaphor. What is more certain? than the moon, the sun, and the tides. These are these very strong natural phenomena that she compares herself to, things that we see every day, that we live with. And with the certainty of the sun coming up in the morning and the moon coming up in the evening, that is the certainty with which she will rise. Oh, the moon and the sun are constant and certain throughout the ages. We are seeing the same moon than the people did 5,000 years ago. Hey, so with that certainty, that is how sure she is that she will rise. Tide, I think also a very um, effective metaphor. The moon causes the tides. Hey, and the tides come in and go out every day. Just like certain ages, people come and people go. Ideas come and ideas go, just like the tides. But she is constant. Despite changing times, she will rise. Is she talking about just herself now? No, she's talking about black women probably in general or any oppressed group. Just like hopes springing high. Okay, so this is based on an idiom. Hope springs eternal, meaning we will always have hope, even in the darkest situation. And in this case, the hopes will spring high. She has high hopes for herself and for her future and the future of her people. Hey, so hope is eternal and it is very high. Still, I'll rise. There's the repetition of the mantra or um, refrain. Okay. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes. Okay, people, so again, these rhetorical questions, again, involving the reader. She 
addresses this reader in these questions specifically. Hey, the tone is accusing. She's accusing the reader of something. Namely, do you want to see me downtrodden? Do you want to see me as someone who is worthless? My broken spirit, my head down, my eyes lowered. When we expect someone to be downtrodden, to be sad, to be humiliated, we do not expect them to walk with confidence like they have oil wells. We expect them to um, walk with lowered eyes, to not look the world in the eyes. Hey. Shoulders falling down like teardrops. What figure of speech is this, Dube? So, um, it's a simulium. Well, yes. Right. And what is compared to what? Um, shoulders falling are compared to teardrops. Yes, exactly. And do you think it's an effective figure of speech? Indeed, it is, ma'am, because um, the just like teardrops that are, that fall that would um, fall from your eyes down, um, it definitely gives you a very um, vivid image of how um, she describes um, shoulders, um, comparing it to teardrops. Yes, they are both indications of being very sad hey when you are sad you cry tears fall from your eyes and your shoulders are slumped you feel sad hey you don't walk upright weakened by my soulful cries so she has cried many times but she has recovered yet they want to see her weakened by the fact that she has cried so often that these horrible things have happened to her that has made her cry Stanza five. Does my haughtiness offend you? What does it mean to be haughty? It means to consider yourself above others. Hey, it means to have pride, arrogance, and even to scorn to look down upon others. Don't you take it awful hard? Okay, people, this is once again a little bit slangy, if that's even a word. It should be, don't you take it awfully hard? But in this case, um, she uses these words specifically to um, involve the reader, to make it seem as though she is speaking in her everyday life. Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. Do you see the elision again? The leaving out of the B and the last G in digging. Hey, the image has now progressed. First, she had oil wells in her living room. Now she has gold mines in her backyard from something very expensive to something even more expensive. Hey, gold, something shiny and wonderful. So she laughs. When you think of someone sad and downtrodden and oppressed, you don't think of them laughing, hey? Yet she laughs like a rich person who has mines in her own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. Marley, what figure of speech is this? Personification. Yes, it could be personification because um, words are not able to shoot. You can add that there to the notes, definitely. Okay, it's also a metaphor though. The words are compared to a gun. Now violence has entered the poem. Why do you think she uses these violent images? Shoot me, cut me, Ma kill me. Yes, Dube? Ma'am, uh, isn't it maybe because of what you've um, seen, how um, how people have been oppressed, how they, the violent methods that's been used to um, oppress them? Yes, exactly. Black people, black women, women have been the victims of violence many, many times throughout history. So the poem, I don't think, would have been complete without these very violent images. Hey, you may shoot me with your words. The words are like a gun aiming at her, pointing to her, hurting her. You may cut me with your eyes. In this case, the um, 
uh, cruel looks that she receives are compared to knives cutting her, hurting her. You may kill me with your hatefulness. Now, people, this may be interpreted literally or figuratively. Okay. Literally, black people have been killed because of race wars, because of hatefulness. Um, and figuratively, they may kill her spirit. Hey? But still, like air, I'll rise. Now, first she compared herself to dust. Now she compares herself to air. Mudley, what happens to air when it heats up? Um, it rises. Exactly. When air is heated, it starts to rise. Hot air rises up. That's why we get hot air balloons and things like that. Just like when things heat up in her life because of violence, she will rise. She compares herself to this very light thing, this unmissable thing in this case, namely air. And she will rise. She will continue to rise. Stanza seven. Now she says, does my sexiness upset you? When we think of the poor, the sick, the oppressed, we do not think about them as being sexy. Hey. So she says, does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Okay, people, this is a very provocative image. She's owning her womanhood and her sexuality, which is something that people have taken away from black women in the past. Um, when black women were slaves on the plantations, they were often raped um, and were at the beck and call of their employers. Whenever they demanded it, they had to provide. Hey. So in this case, she's owning her sexuality. This provocative image of a diamond at the meeting of her thighs, showing that she thinks that her womanhood and her sexuality is actually worth something. It's not just something to be thrown away or disregarded. She owns it. She's proud of it. Hey. People, do you see the progression from oil wells to gold mines to diamonds? What do these three things have in common? They are very precious minerals, making the owner of them very rich. And also they have to be mined. They are not just available on the surface for anyone to take. You have to deserve them. You have to mine for them, to work for them. Okay, so if you want... Um, to be part of her laughter and her sexuality and her confidence. You have to work for it. It's not just there on the surface. Stanza eight. Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Do you see the alliteration there? Huts of histories. Okay, people that are referring here to the huts in Africa and for the um, slaves in the plantations. Okay, they didn't live in proper houses. They lived in huts and they are maybe ashamed of this history. It's important that this line um, is the, and the next similar line stand on their own, I rise, okay? It stresses the fact that she promises that nothing will destroy her. Her race will survive, that cannot be contained. Up from a past that's rooted in pain. People, this is a metaphor. She compares her past to a tree and like her tree is rooted in the ground, her past is rooted in pain. Where she comes from is a place of pain. But now she has changed. She is a black ocean, leaping and wide. This is a very powerful image. Hey, She's not just a puddle or a river. She's this mysterious, powerful, vast, majestic thing. An ocean. Willing and swelling, I bear the tide. People, again, we are reminded of the tides, the different emotions, the different things that she has been subjected to, and she has borne it in her very powerful way. Hey, the tone here is hopeful. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. Okay, people, do you see the antithesis there between nights and daybreak? In this case, there are metaphors. Night is symbolic of her past. Terror and fear, her past has been terrible and fearful. Into a daybreak, her future will not be like that. 
even though her past has been scary and hurtful, her future will be wondrously clear. It will be bright and wonderful. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, what did her ancestors give her? Freedom. She's no longer a slave. Hey, she has this whole history of strength that she got from her ancestors. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Now, this is the line in the poem that gives you goosebumps. Hey, because what did the slaves dream of? Most of all, they dreamt of freedom. Freedom. And the only Yes, the only way that the slaves could gain freedom was by dying. And that's why they had all these hymns about asking the Lord to come and take them. And they hoped that one day their ancestors would be free. And she is. She's free. She's sexy. She's haughty. She's sassy. She's powerful. Okay. The one thing that black women have not had historically is power. And that is why she wrote this poem in such a powerful way to emphasize the fact that she has gained power in her life through her poetry, through her strength, through her work as a humanitarian and an activist. I rise, I rise, I rise. Why do you think she repeats these words? Ma'am, I think... Ma she repeats these words because she wants to emphasize the fact that she rose um, the spot of everything that happened and everything that happened in the past and that she is still she came stronger and she's still going to fight for the freedom they deserve. Exactly. Dube, what did you want to say? Uh, I wanted to say basically the same thing. And, Basically the same. Uh, yes, ma'am, and uh, also maybe of what might happen, uh, what might happen in the future, that she will yes. still rise. Yes, it's a continuous action. Hey, she will also rise in the future. Okay, guys, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for a very good lesson.